Broadcasting from the Investor Hour studios and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere you find podcasts for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here's your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today, we'll talk with Kevin Duffy. Kevin Duffy's back. I love talking with Kevin. He's a great investor, and he's also a very free market-minded guy, so he brings a whole new perspective to investing and really to life, as far as I'm concerned. Great guy. It's going to be a great talk, I promise. This week in the mailbag, one of the best mailbags ever. Listeners Dean, Wade S., Mark S., Coach Z, and an unprecedented two questions from listener Taylor S. And remember, the mailbag is a conversation, so talk to me. Call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357, and hear your voice on the show. My opening rant this week will be very, very quick. And the topic is simply that the market has set another record. We'll talk about that and what I think it means that and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. There are actually two topics today. Let's get to the, the market record first. What, what's happened in the past few days here is that the S&P 500 is up 100% from the COVID panic bottom, March 23rd, 2020. This is the second fastest ascent to 100% gain, the second fastest doubling in the index, going all the way back to 1928. The index was created um, not very long ago at all, but they take the data all the way back to 1928. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the second fastest. What was the fastest was, what, 32, 1932? You know, it's just breathtaking speed after a huge calamity in both cases and not really not a bad performance over the next few years in the 30s but you know they did get 1937 that wasn't a very good year at all and our circumstances are different here aren't they because while we do we, we've had this huge bubble now right now we're exceeding the 1929 peak so there, there are some common features and some uncommon features. So I think the comparison is of limited value. <laughs> However, the market has doubled in record time and it's done it. So several people on Twitter have pointed out to me, several really good folks like Jason Gefford and Sven Heinrich, just a couple other folks uh, have pointed out that the market, it, it lacks breadth. And what they mean by breadth is basically the number of, it, it's the difference between the number of new highs and the number of new lows. So what, what these guys are all saying is that the market has, it's hitting new highs with very few companies actually in the index actually hitting new highs. It's like the, the number of companies hitting new highs is one of the lowest amounts, you know, again, going back to 1928, you know, it's, it's uh, some of the lowest breadth. So if you think about the implications of that, right? So in a bull market, hey, all the stocks are going up, lots of companies making new highs, and the indexes are therefore making new highs, makes all the sense of the world. But then, you know, maybe Maybe as the bull market just weakens and weakens and weakens, the the bigger companies that that it can pull more of the index along, right? The indexes are market cap weighted. So as long as enough big companies continue to rise and make new highs, the index can keep going up and making new highs. But fewer and fewer and fewer companies are making new highs. So the bull market is arguably possibly getting weaker and weaker as we go. And, you know, this is like one of the weakest moments going back to 1928, <laughs> uh, which is a long time. In 1928, if you'll recall, that was what, like one of the best years in the stock market ever. And 
it was followed by, you know, 1929, right? So as far as I'm concerned, this kind of supports why I'm my concerns that we are heading into possibly a bear market, possibly some kind of a correction, you know, somewhere between down 5% and down 70%. How about that for a range of possibilities, right? Right, what do we say? Risk is the potential range of outcomes. A wide potential range of outcomes is high risk. A narrow potential range of outcomes is low risk. And as the market gets you know, weaker and weaker and the valuation gets higher and higher, I think we are looking at a potentially wider and wider range of outcomes. Therefore, the market is riskier and riskier. So you got to prepare for that. And you know what I always say, hold plenty of cash. And if you don't mind losing money, losing a little bit of money for the protection, you can buy some put options uh, on the big indexes. But that's, that's really all I have to say about that. The other thing that I want to point out is that I talked about in a recent episode, I talked about this kind of, it's, it's not necessarily my favorite trade, but it's one of them, is the value growth trade. And I said that the value indexes were, had been outperforming since last fall, since October. The value indexes were outperforming the growth indexes. But there was a dip in early June. And I said, hey, man, this is a viable dip in the value growth divergence. Well, so far, that's wrong because growth has come screaming back. And, you know, as long as you see like the big indexes making new highs, you know, like as long as you see the S&P 500 even with all the technology and stuff that's in that, you know, growth is probably outperforming and it's, and it's, you know, it's come screaming back. So, you know, if you bought that dip, I still think the trade is a long-term trade. I thought that was a, a good entry point into it. But, and I still, I like, I haven't given up. Like I still have my, my value fund in my 401k. Uh, and I'm not giving up on it because I think longer term, this it's going to work out. And I don't want to be short in a 401k. Shorting is really nasty, nasty business. It's very difficult. You're highly likely to lose money. So I don't want to be short in a 401k. It doesn't make sense to me. Right? So I'd rather buy a value fund. So that's what I've done. But <laughs> so far, not great. Okay. That's the rant. That's it. My quote of the week is less about investing and less about, you know, the market being horribly expensive and whether or not to buy it or sell it or hold it or whatever. And it's more about how great capital allocators think about great businesses that they run and that they own. And the the quote is by one of the all-time greats, Henry Singleton, right? Singleton co-founded and ran a company called Teledyne. And he was the CEO. He was the founder of Teledyne. He was the CEO of it from 1960 to 1986. And he took the company through very distinct phases. You know, in the beginning, he was a rapidly expanding conglomerate and he would acquire the company. Aggressively acquiring with really expensive shares was like a really cool thing. Um, he was one of the pioneers of that. And then, you know, the stock had fallen and the P.E. ratio was really low and the stock was cheap. So he started buying it back. He's like, you know, the father of buybacks in a way. And later in his career, he said, you know, people are doing all these buybacks. There's got to be something wrong with it. Right. He knew it had gone too far. But, you know, just aggressively bought back the stock and it screamed, it roared and it did really great as he bought it back. And then, you know, in, in a later period of the company, he, he spun out the, the less, lesser performers in the portfolio. Really a brilliant capital allocator. He's, he's somebody who you'll hear if you attend the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, you will regularly hear Charlie Munger and or Warren Buffett talk about Henry Singleton. And so the quote is from Henry Singleton, and it's simply this. We're subject to a tremendous number of outside influences, and the vast majority of them cannot be predicted. So my idea is to stay flexible, to keep coming to work every day. I like to steer the boat each day rather than plan ahead way into the future. That's Henry Singleton, former CEO and founder of Teledyne, great capital allocator. And 
I really like the quote because, you know, he actually uses a phrase of mine that I've used many times over the years. He says, keep coming to work every day, right? And that's one of the reasons why I tell people don't sell your stocks and bonds. As long as all those great companies keep coming to work every day, they're great companies. And they're allocating capital to really great businesses. And they're earning great returns on that capital. And it will compound over time, no matter what's happening in the stock market over the short term. Right. So he, he kept coming to work every day and he kept allocating to great businesses uh, and, you know, doing the other things that I described. And it turned out really well for investors. It was a huge multi bagger over the long term. Teledyne. Henry Singleton. Great quote. All right. Let's do it. Let's talk with Kevin Duffy. Let's do it right now. Here's a critical update you do not want to miss. He's found more 1,000% winners than anyone in the history of our business. But my colleague Eric Wade says what's coming next is even bigger, and it could help you make 25 times your money without the volatility of cryptos and without giving up the upside of cryptos that could make you 5, 10, even 25 times your money or more. Eric says it doesn't matter whether you followed him for a short time or if you've never bought crypto before. And to be clear, this opportunity is not just buy Bitcoin or just buy Ethereum or any other single opportunity in the crypto world. And no, it's not buy penny cryptos either. It's much, much bigger. And they're all asset-backed opportunities, a way to generate massive income off crypto without having to worry about crypto volatility. Eric is going live on Wednesday, July 21st with a historic update to reveal all the details about this opportunity and why you can't afford to miss it. Get all the details at CryptoCash2021.com. That's CryptoCash2021.com. Check it out right away. Then be sure to tune in next Thursday when Eric comes on our show and reveals these updates. Time for our interview once again. Really looking forward to this one. Today, we're talking with Kevin Duffy. Kevin was a previous guest, and he's come back again to talk with us. Kevin Duffy is a battle-proven contrarian investor and veteran in the risky business of short selling. He co-founded Bearing Asset Management in 2002. He was a vocal critic of the 2007 credit bubble, successfully shorting many of its most aggressive players, including Countrywide Financial and Bear Stearns. Kevin bought his first stock at the age of 13. He has a passion for Austrian economics. He's the author of the popular Notable and Quotable blog and the Coffee Can Portfolio. Kevin, welcome back. Great to have you back. Great. Thanks for having me back, Dan. The first time around, we talked about your background and stuff. And, you know, if, if anybody wants to, to go back and and listen to that. We, you know, it's on our website. So this time, I just want to dive in. And I'm looking at another recent interview you did. And there's just, there's a sentence that leaps off the page and demands some explanation. <laughs> and you said, in my mind, the next bear market has already started. And of course, you know, the market's been making new highs, you know, did so not very long ago at all as we speak. So so what do you mean by that? The next bear market has already started, even though it seems to be just going up and up and up. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, it's funny. You, you, you talk to somebody for, you know, an hour or so and, and uh, you know, then it comes down to a, a catchy headline, right? Oh, well, right. You know, That's you're right. predicting the next bear market. <laughs> uh, so... I assure you, I, I, I was really not trying to do that. Um, I know you, your mantra is, uh, is don't predict, prepare. And I think I've learned some, some lessons over the years uh, not to stick my neck out too far. But I think what I was trying to get at there is the idea that, um, you know, that we've had this, this incredible swing from, um, you know, sort of this, I wouldn't say the depths of despair, but uh, but certainly the pessimism, the panic that we we went from uh, from March of last year to today, where you've got all the exuberance, 
that um, and and also sucking the retail investor back into the market, uh, the craziness with the meme stocks, uh, the you know the IPOs that we've we've had. We've never seen the, the this kind of froth in the IPO market uh, since really 2000, and uh, you know that kind of peaked in in the middle of February, and so it's just that uh, you know we've gone from one extreme to another, and and this. This seems to have all the hallmarks of, of, a, of a top, but uh, also the point that I was trying to make was that um, what you typically see at, at tops is a breakdown below the surface, and which we've gotten, and you get this rotation that's taking place, even though the, the averages are going to, to new highs. So there's sort of a, a stealth bear market that seems to be taking place over the last four months. Yeah, I, I, I've certainly, um, I've heard you say a lot more about it. I just, you know, I had to pull that headline out. It <laughs> sort of <laughs> demanded an answer. But but yeah, I, I've, I've heard other folks say the same thing. And they're watching just sort of a narrower and narrower and narrower concentration of what is pulling the overall indexes higher. You know, one guy said on Twitter, you know, he feels like he's on the Titanic shouting iceberg and everyone else is just inside dancing and having a good time. But, but yeah, I, I agree. I don't want to try to call a top. It's kind of a fool's errand, isn't it? it? It is. But at the same time, I think we have to be cognizant of the risks that are out there and, uh, and, uh, you know, try to try to protect ourselves from that uh, and try to sort of map out, maybe not, not a precise prediction, but uh, different scenarios and how they can play out and what the risks are and how we protect ourselves. And I think, you know, one of the risks is, well, there are several, but, um, but one is the fact that you've had this massive leveraging taking place, uh, the margin debt going up to all time highs. Um, I think there's also this uh, perception that we can throw trillions of dollars at the economy through stimulus and that somehow this will just magically all work out. Uh, I think that that is a, uh, you know, a thesis that is going to be tested at some point. And so I think we've got to be very aware that uh, that there's economic risk that is is building in the system and, you know, ways to we have to think about ways to protect ourselves. Totally agree. Must we risk is is a the wider range of outcomes. Higher risk means a wider range of outcomes. So you have to prepare for that wider range. You know, falling short of saying this is the top and I'm gonna, you know, just put all my money in put options. You don't have to do anything crazy like that. So that kind of begs the question then, Kevin, how how does one prepare? What do you do? What what does maybe I should even just ask, what does your portfolio look like by way of preparation? Well, I think of, of this uh, in terms of preparation, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of preparation that, that takes place. There's a lot of sitting on your hands and not doing much, but there's also while you're sitting on your hands, you're, you're learning, you're reading, you're preparing, you're trying to identify, uh, you know, great companies, uh, things that you want to invest in when opportunities present themselves. And, you know, I think in terms of, sort of going to the to the supermarket every day or the marketplace or the grocery store and there are different different aisles to the grocery store you know there is the uh, let's say the inflation hedge aisle and that that risk there is the um, you know the big waves that are mega trends that are taking place and companies that are are positioned a, a ahead of those um, there are defensive companies that are going to you know basically provide ballast in the portfolio and uh, um, you know so really and then there are you know special situations there are companies that will do well uh, economically sensitive um, and so you know really what what it is is a lot of preparation then kind of going down to the market and saying well what's on sale today and so uh, and typically what's on sale is is where the, the crowd is not going right it's it's a it's away from the crowd, so um, yeah, I think that's all I'm trying to do is just all right. Take what the defense gives you. What's on sale? What am I looking for in in my portfolio? And right now, as I said, I think the economic risk is very high. So um, 
I want defensive stocks. I want real, really ballast in the portfolio, steady eddies that, uh, that I think will hold up during, a, during tough times. So I think that's one of the things that, uh, that we look at. You know, another, and, and those, those are on sale today. You know, it's interesting if we go back to last year, the panic in, in uh, March of, 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 um, of 2020, um, what was on sale were sort of the, the retailers and economically sensitive, uh, the, the companies that had been, the retailers that had been basically shut down. I mean, that was, that was what was on sale. And maybe in hindsight, that was a sign that the economy was not ready to, uh, you know, be the, the, uh, the front and center risk. I think today that economic risk is, is, uh, is a lot closer. And, and, and by the way, last year, you know, 15 months ago, defensive stocks were, were very expensive. And I think today we're seeing a lot more opportunities there as opposed to the, um, the economically stock economically sensitive stocks, which have really bounced back quite a bit. Okay. So first of all, when I hear you talk about steady eddies, you know, that don't suffer so much, I feel like you're talking about the business and not the stock price. Do I have that right? Yes. Yes. And the, the, uh, the business absolutely. And which comes first. And then it's, it, it's, it's a matter of, okay, what, what am I looking for? What fills the portfolio? And, but we also have to marry that with, uh, you know, if, I would love to buy defensive stocks, but let's say we're in an environment where defensive stocks are, are insanely expensive. Well, um, just the fact that it's a great business and it's defensive, we're taking on price risk now. So it's not going to really do us a whole lot of good. So you got to have both of them, right? Okay, I see. But then, you know, the, the next thing I heard, though, was that these are not terribly overpriced right now. They're decent, decent deals. Yeah, I think, you know, this is what is interesting about the environment. Um, you know, one of the rules that I have, I've come up with a bunch of rules in, in the coffee can portfolio. And one of the rules is that it's a market of stocks, not a stock market. And, you know, I've learned a lot of these rules from, you know, kind of the school of hard knocks. And um, this, this environment, Jean-Marie Evillard, you know, the great value investor, he said that um, he's always able to find, it didn't matter, you know, every bubble, he was always able to find opportunities, always able to find values. So the only exception to that was the, uh, the late 1980s Japan bubble. And so, you know, I think that's one of the things that, you know, I believe we're in a bubble right now, but bubbles, um, you had a guest on Diego Perea, the author of, of Anti-Bubbles, uh, and, uh, you know, they, they present these, these pockets, bubbles always present pockets of anti-bubbles. And there's always, you know, there, there's this funneling effect that takes place. But aside from that, there's also areas that kind of, kind of get uh, abandoned. So, um, you know, I think that's the, the beauty of the environment that we're in is that even though there's risk, there, there's a sort of a natural way it's, it's pointing us to, uh, in terms of, of how to, to deal with that. And there are pockets I think the, the defensive stocks are, so I, let me just give you an example. Um, I know you're, you're familiar with the, the dollar store space. Okay. And, um, and, and I know dollar general has been a, a pick of yours for a while, uh, for a long time, I believe. And, um, but, uh, you know, dollar tree is a uh, stock that we recently added to the portfolio. And that basically if I, the problem with dollar tree was that they bought, Family Dollar in uh, 2015, and and actually, um, Dollar General outbid them for for Family Dollar, <laughs> but um, because of antitrust concerns, uh, Dollar Tree ended up buying the company. Well, it, it's been kind of a boat anchor, and uh, it's been really a, a, a long slog and a lot tougher to turn this this company around. But if you if you separate the two chains, you look at Dollar Tree, and you compare them to let's say Dollar General. Um, you know, there's, there's, they're pretty comparable and, um, and, and yet Dollar General has a much bigger uh, valuation, a much bigger uh, a premium. And if you were to just give uh, Dollar Tree just for their, their part of the business, a you know, haircut that the valuation, let's say 10%, you're basically getting 
family dollar for, for just about nothing right now, um, even though things are starting to turn around. So, you know, there are just a lot of pockets of, of opportunity out there, uh, and I'm seeing more of them, in the, uh, thankfully, in the defensive area. Okay, great. You got another, and if you don't want to n- name a particular stock, that's fine. We, we understand. But, but do you got another industry or, or area for me that's, that you view as defensive and kind of reasonably priced these days? Uh, you know, there's one of the things that we, we look at is uh, owner operators. We like to have skin in the game. And, um, you know, so, so some of the, we, we own uh, Calmain Foods in, uh, in the, egg, the egg producer uh, we own um, uh, San Filippo in, uh, in in peanuts and, and nuts, and, and the you know both companies have high insider ownership. They're just very steady businesses. Um, they tend to be, you know, the pricing of something like uh, eggs is, and their their costs tend to be cyclical, very much like the you know the poultry business, and um, so. Those are the types of businesses that that we're looking for. They're in they're food related, um, but uh, and, and so the cyclicality part is is really more in pricing. It's not in terms of the demand for their for their product, the economic sensitivity. Gotcha. So you know you buy these defensive industries, but you know sooner or later, what do you? I'm curious. We've acknowledged that it's the it's the industry that's defensive. And that, you know, that implies, of course, what I'm saying is the stock price could go anywhere and, and likely will, will go down if we see a bear market or a crash. Are you telling me that you're ready to hold straight through that? You know, even if we get, if we're down 40, 50% or something like that? Oh, sure. Absolutely. And, uh, what I've tried to do with the portfolio is you know, there are a number of, of areas. It's not just defensive. I, I think, um, like I said, there are different aisles to the grocery store. And, um, you know, I, I think we're going to have an inflation problem um, at, at some point. Um, I also think that, you know, I've learned, you know, another lesson over the years is, is the importance of, of balance. So I don't want to have all of my eggs in the defensive basket. You know, I, I want to be aware of, of some of the big trends that are, are going on out there. And I think this is one of the things that's, that happened last year. When you get a crisis, you kind of flip the switch on a lot of these things. Um, and you see the importance of, you know, we've, we've seen not just e-commerce has been accelerated, but stay at home, uh, work at home, um, the uh, the migration out of the cities to the suburbs. Um, we we saw, um, you know, with the vaccines, this whole genomic revolution has really really picked up steam. So, you know, I don't want to give the impression that oh, I'm just you know grizzly bear and and I'm just thinking about you know everything that could possibly go wrong. You know, I'm also very much aware of the things that can go right, and I think that you know the overriding. Um, you know, I'm definitely a kind of a big picture, you know, macro trend investor. And I'm trying to, you know, not just get so fixated on all the negatives, but think about some of the positives that are taking place. And, uh, you know, I, th- I think that, uh, that we've got the middle class is, is sort of being squeezed in the United States uh, for a number of reasons. I think one of, the, one of the trends that got turned on was this cultural Marxism that's been sort of simmering below the surface, and then this, you know, the, the, the switch was, was flipped. So, um, you know, you have, you have uh, the, the middle class being squeezed. That's another reason why I like uh, the discount retailers like, uh, like Dollar Tree. But, you know, on the other side of that is the emergence of the middle class in uh, places like China. And, uh, you know, so that is going to be a, a big wave. So I see some, you know, really powerful positive things going on as well, not just the negatives, but, you know, the genomic revolution. And there was some recent um, uh, trial one results uh, at uh, Intellia Therapeutics uh, with a, a rare uh, liver disease that was happened, uh, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And, um, you know, this is, this is all happening. So these are, the, these are, these are big waves. And, and, you know, when I look at there's, there's just, there's a lot of opportunity on, on, like I said, on both sides. And I think you have to try to maintain balance and, and, 
you know, this is something that I'm, I'm not just trying to think about, you know, everything that can go wrong, but, but also things that can go right. Yeah. It just, it's like, it's just dumb to be too bearish all the time or, or really almost any amount of the time, right? You, you, you make money in equities because b good businesses produce more cash than they literally know what to do with, right? I mean, it's, it's being bearish is really, really a hard way to make a living. I think you make a living in this business being a realist and being, you know, just dedicated to reality and just, you know, and part of, part of that is that I don't think you can, you can be objective if you, um, if you're all, if you're so one-sided and you, you know, if you specialize in, in an area, you know, you, you get, um, you get blinded to everything else that's going on. Um, you know, so I, I, I really think that, um, that, you know, you have to maintain this, this balance. That's, that's really important. Okay. I agree. You maintain a balance, but, but actually what I'm saying is, and you know, agree or disagree. I, I I'm not sure. I, I think we agree here, but, but if we don't, that's cool. Right. You, I, I have to maintain over the long term a kind of a, a bullish, optimistic viewpoint. I'm, I'm looking for businesses that, that I think will do well like 99% of the time. 99% of the time, I'm not looking to buy puts and, and you know be terrified that the market's going to crash. 99% of the time, I just want to know what the good businesses are and are they priced for a good return. Uh, I, we recently talked to somebody in another interview that we're going to publish soon, you know, and he was talking about short selling and like being bearish all the time is just bad business, I guess, is, is the bottom line and being too bearish. And, and, and you know, there are, there are businesses out there. There are more businesses out there that you should think about buying. It almost seems. You know, you should spend more time thinking about when you're going to buy them, maybe, or at what valuation, than you should ever think about. You know, which ones do I want to short? Even, no. I mean, am, am, you see what I'm where I'm heading here? Yes. Yeah, I, I think I do, and and especially as somebody who has a lot of experience on the short side, you know, the problem is that you can only make a hundred percent of your money, and and then you know, once the idea. If it if it works out perfectly well, you know you've spent all that time doing the research, and then it's over, and um, that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario, of course, is it just completely wipes you out, and you know things, and you're wrong, and and it's sucking up an incredible amount of not only your your capital but your energy, your time, and your energy, and you're getting, you, and then you're forced into this short term. Uh, thinking, you know, you're, you're, you're worried about, you know, what, what the stock market's going to do tomorrow, you know, as opposed to freeing up your time and your energy to focus on the big picture, to focus on, you know, these long waves that are playing out, what's happening in China, what's happening with the digital revolution, what's happening with the genomic revolution, that these things are going to be playing out over, over decades. So, um, you know, knowledge is, uh, is compound. It compounds, you know, this is what uh, Buffett and Munger talk about all the time. And so I, I think if you're a short seller, you, you're, you're missing out on a lot of that. I think you really have to be thinking about some of these longer term trends and yeah, they, they tend to be positive. I think, look, you know, ultimately I am in the long term. I'm, I'm a, an optimist, you know, I'm a long-term optimist. I think, I think the, the dominant trend that, you know, if we're looking at, at economics, if we're looking at the economy, the, the dominant trend is the hockey stick of human prosperity. Um, you know, I think you have to understand that. I, I, I don't think you want to fight that. Now, you know, there are, um, there are corrections along the way. And there are, you know, just as you have maybe China emerging and you have Russia that sort of went into the socialist abyss and, you know, they're coming back. Um, you know, you also have, and, and Chile had, had this really nice run and, and flirted with free, free market economics and, and uh, limited government. Well, you know, then you have, you have the Venezuelas out there that are going in, in the other direction, right? You know, so, so um, you know, there are, 
there are countervailing forces. And I think it's important, you know, not to put on blinders. And, you know, I, I get concerned, you know, when you look at somebody like Warren Buffett, um, you know, I, obviously there's a, a tremendous amount of, of skill involved in, in what he and, and Munger have accomplished. I'm not trying to, to take away from that. But you also have to wonder, you know, how much luck is involved because I don't, I don't think I want to, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with this economics and, and, and is he really prepared? You know, what if, what if the United States were to go down a, a similar path to, to Venezuela or is, is Buffett, does he have that in his toolkit? Is he really ready to adapt if the United States were to go down that road? And I think as an investor, you have to be prepared for that. You can't just be, uh, you know, a, uh, an eternal optimist and be blind to to reality. I agree. And with Buffett, you know, and a lot of people who are insanely wealthy, billions and billions in 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 wealth, they they all strike me similarly in that they their their political or economic views. You mentioned his economics that you don't necessarily agree with. It's very status quo, and that makes a lot of sense because they have thrived like no one else in the status quo, right? So it, it makes a little bit of sense it, it is all I'm saying. Sure. And, the, you know, this is the thing about um, intervention, government intervention, is it, it does reward the incumbents. Um, you know, it's, it's portrayed a different way as being for the, the little guy and the underdog and all the rest of it. But the, the reality is just the opposite. It is. It is. And I've, I've discussed it on the podcast a couple of times in relation to, especially to banking and finance, how we're always told that we're going to, you know, regulate this industry and it's going to improve things for the customer and all this stuff. But really, the regulations have absolutely made it more difficult for the competition versus the incumbents. And I mean, it's, it's like, it's uncontroversial. And that happens in every industry, doesn't it? Like as soon as you put licensing, as soon as you say, you've got to have a $25,000 cosmetology license to braid hair, what's going to happen? Anybody who's got the license has a huge advantage over anybody who doesn't. And, and you know, my only question about all of this is like, why don't people see it? But I suppose it's human nature, right? Yeah, I, I, it is. And you know, it's funny. I, I remember it's a few years ago, they had um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. They had pulled him in front of uh, the Senate, I guess, for a, a hearing. And of course, they wanted to regulate him. And, and, uh, his, and he was very eager to go along this road. I mean, he was so ready. He was salivating at the idea that, oh, you want to regulate me? This is great. This is great. So, you know, and now you've got, there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, antitrust actions against big, the big tech companies and um, uh, talk about repealing um, uh, section, section 230. Um, and I think all these ideas are, are, are just, uh, they're bad ideas. And I think they're going to, if anything, just build a bigger competitive moat for, for the big tech companies. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we have to have a certain amount of faith in free markets. And, and you know, remember that the, the last time there was a, a big antitrust action was against Microsoft in what, the late 1990s. And, um, you know, it's a contrary indicator. It's like the, the bureaucrats out there have, have figured out that, uh, oh, this is just going to go on and on and on forever. And, the, and that these companies are going to get more and more, more dominant. And they're, they're doing that exactly at the time that there's another technology wave that's coming along. You know, the internet had just come along at the same time and surprise, surprise, you know, Microsoft, uh, here's the company that they thought were going to be dominant. And, uh, you know, Bill, there's a really funny quote um, by Bill Gates, and uh, it was about the Google boys. And uh, this was around that time. It was in like the early 2000s. And he said, well, you know, let's let's see what they think when, you know, they're, they're trying to run a big company or something like, you know, it was very sort of condescending, like, yeah, you know, what happens when they grow up? They're, he didn't really take them seriously. Um, you know, so, yeah, the, the government is always... 
they have no faith in, in markets whatsoever. And, and they're actually a pretty good contrary indicator. I think, you know, maybe the fact that they're, they're, uh, they're concerned, they want to break up some of these, these companies, these big tech companies is, you know, maybe we should be going back to the late nineties and thinking about, okay, well, what's the next wave and what, where are they vulnerable? And, and, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe these maybe these companies are, are not something that we really need to worry about and not hit the panic button and try to regulate them because it's it's going to have right the, the negative the law of unintended consequences is going to boomerang on us. Yeah, I thought as soon as you started talking about this, I thought of Microsoft. As soon as the Justice Department comes after you, mm-hmm. you're solid, right? That's the you know that's yeah. the that's the moment. And the other thing, though, is I think of the master settlement agreement for the tobacco companies. Yes. Right. As soon as as soon as they say, well, you're going to have to pay this big penalty or anything. It's almost like a huge buy recommendation because, you know, certainly nobody else, you know, nobody else is going to go into that business. And and even with the secular decline in smoking, those, those companies have been huge cash cows, just huge generators of. Yeah, and, you know, and it's cash. interesting you you bring that up because you know so so po- two points is one is um, you know the fact that they they basically made it illegal for anybody to uh, advertise and, and print. Remember they pulled that, and you know right. how do you if you're an incumbent, what what's the best thing that can happen is you've already created your brand, and now nobody can compete with you through advertising, right? Right. I mean, it's 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 just a wonderful Some penalty. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Some it's penalty, like, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Where do I sign up for this? And, uh, you know, and I, I think the other thing is you, you mentioned, uh, we were talking earlier about defensive companies, you know, that's, that's another area that we don't have any investments there, but I mean, it is, um, they're not, they're not expensive. That's for sure. You know, companies like Altria group. Right. Definitely not expensive. Nobody wants that when they can buy, you know, when they can have the thrill of buying AMC Entertainment or GameStop or whatever it is they're Yeah, or they can is. buy or or they, um, you know, forego companies like that because they don't meet their ESG criteria. Right, ESG. That's another, you know, perversion based on, you know, the government's ability to say, well, we're going to predict the weather and the weather's based on energy. So we're against energy and all the companies wind up being against energy companies and they do these other things. And and that, of course, has the opposite effect, um, which I was also talking about recently with with another guest who Harris Kupperman, who will be on uh, in another couple episodes. And it has the opposite effect, right? So People say, well, okay, the government's coming after me or whatever it is. We're, we're not producing as much oil and gas. What happens to the price of oil? Right. And by association, oil stocks and oil services companies, they become great bets because, you know, this ESG nonsense has has artificially crimped the supply amidst rising demand because, you know, all that renewable stuff is like diddly squat percent of the mix. And we need oil and gas like for transportation we need them absolutely. We must have them. And now we're starting to move around more after the, you know, as the pandemic uh, lockdowns right. hopefully uh, go away. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and as investors, I, I think of it as um, as a game um, and that, uh, you know, we we look at the different players in the game. It's almost like playing poker. And if, if you don't know who the patsy is at the poker table, it's you. So, you know, I think it's important to know who the different players are in the game and what their biases are, what their blind spots are. And, um, you know, the, the fact when, when you have a new crop of especially younger people and they're sort of ideologically, ideologically wired to think a certain way, maybe they don't care about profit. Maybe, maybe they're, uh, uh, they're very critical of of profit, um, and they're motivated uh, to do uh, in different ways. You know that that creates opportunity for for us as as players in this game. And so I I welcome the ESG movement. I think it's a great thing. Uh, I think it's going to be the gift that kind of keeps giving for a very long time. I think it's going to create a lot of opportunity for us. And again, I think it's all about dedication to reality. And if you've got uh, competitors in this game that are 
basically dedicated to unreality, then that, that gives us an advantage, gives us an edge. I agree. By being so, so silly, um, it creates low hanging fruit for the rest of us, doesn't it? A absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's like, go ahead, make it easier. You know, go ahead, you know, chew up a bunch of capital and, and, and make things difficult for for some commodity that we desperately need to function as a as a, a global economy. Go ahead and do that so that I can be long. Yep. Yeah. And you know, and I also I like I like ideas that um, that touch a lot of different areas, like some of these bigger waves and uh, you know, the commodities right now, if you if you think about China and uh, the the growing middle class in China, I think, I think they're adding, you know, the middle class there. Um, it's increasing every year. It's about, uh, about uh, that the population of, of Canada, I think I heard it's, you know, it's just a huge number. And, you know, these people are, are, they're all going to be consuming more and more commodities. So, um, so even if, even if we, we think that we can not consume commodities, which is in this country, which is, of course is ab absurd. You know, I think that there is going to be demand there over the next 10 years. And I think that's really what, what I'm trying to do is look out, you know, what is the world going to look like 10 years from now? And maybe beyond that. Let me ask you this. When, when you do that kind of an exercise, to me, it makes sense, all the sense in the world. And I say the same thing. I say, we want to, you know, we want a business that we think will be around in five or 10 years, but that's a bottom up assessment. You know, it's not even um, an industry assessment, except that, you know, we, we know that we're going to probably have somebody collecting our garbage. So maybe we want to still own waste management in five or 10 years, you know, something really simple like that. But it feels to me like, you know, technological change, it's, it's a, it's a difficult thing. And it's, it's, I guess my only point here, Kevin, I don't know if there's a question. It's hard to really look ahead five or 10 years. So when you say that, do you distinguish between, you know, like the waste managements of the world and the, you know, maybe Constellation brands or a beer company or something versus, you know, even something like Google, maybe search or online ad technology changes or something in 10 years. Is there a difference for you? Yes. Yeah. I, that's a, a very interesting point, um, and and I think it is it, the way you uh, frame it. It is kind of a a barbell approach. It's um, you know on the one hand you have businesses that you you look at and you think well, these these aren't necessarily disruptable, right? And then, but I I think on the other hand I, I don't want to and I, so I do want to pay attention to those businesses. But on the other hand, I don't want to just turn off the other side of my brain that's not thinking about these long technology waves and the disruption that's going to take place and and how that may change the, the future. You know, who who is who is going to be disrupted by that? Um, you know, I there's a there's a really interesting interview that I, I just read and it was by Andy Grove in uh, 2001. And I, I highly recommend it because you know, here is a, a classic visionary. And um, I think it's always interesting to see, because here we have the benefit of 20 years, right? In, in knowing how things played out. And, um, and you know, what I, what I realized from looking at things like that, and I, I, I love looking at, at predictions and, and visionaries and sort of where, you know, where they get it right and where they get it wrong. And, um, you know, typically it's a matter of timing um, and with, with these long waves, um, but there is a point where they reach an inflection point and um, they become real. So, you know, Andy Grove was talking about the genomic revolution 20 years ago, okay? But it's taken all this time uh, for all the pieces to sort of come together. So I think, you know, it's this classic S curve and where are you on the, on the S curve? Um, and you know, that, that's what you're, what you're trying to figure out. I think it's in terms of, so, so, you know, I'm, 
I'm certainly looking at at something like the the genomic revolution. I, I think over the next ten years we're going to see amazing things taking place, and I think there will be there will be fortunes that are are are, are made. Um, but you know, when we think about these technology ways, we also have to think about you know that goes through certain phases, right? So you have the beginning phase, which is this, uh, you know, you're at the inflection point, right? You're at, okay, now it's become obvious, this is gonna be a big deal. And then everybody and his brother jumps in. And so it's, it's really impossible to figure out, you know, who the, who the real, uh, real companies are from, from the, the has-beens. And so you get this, um, you know, you, you kind of get the, the shakeout that takes place. It has to take place. You, know, you get the initial frenzy, and then uh, typically you'll get a shakeout, and, um, you know, the, the pioneers take the arrows in the back. And then the next wave is where the settlers get rich. Um, that's what you, I think, as investors, we want to be constantly aware of, you know, is where, where are we? In this cycle, and then you know, th then you get to the top of the S curve, and you get the more um, you know the maturing phase of it. And th and there can still be plenty of money made during that phase. Don't get me wrong, but you know, so I, I just try to be aware of of where we are in all this. And you know, we could we could like I said, I think with with genomics, um, we're probably at that in that sweet spot. I'm thinking maybe something like let's say blockchain or cryptocurrencies being an application of that, that feels to me like, like that early pioneer phase. Um, I think you have what, something like 9,000 cryptocurrencies and, and, you know, it seems to me like that, like the blockchain technology, I, I don't profess to be an expert, but, but it, it seems like it'll have some real applications, but we probably have to go through a, a shakeout first. Um, electric vehicles in, in China, I think there are 120 electric vehicle companies, you know, this feels to me like the, uh, like the uh, early days of the 1920s with the automobile industry. So I think just um, being aware of, of where you are on the S curve, uh, vaguely, this is not precise, is, is important. And so, yeah, you know, back to your original point, it's kind of a, a barbell approach, you know, who is going to be disrupted, who are the disruptors, and then, you know, industries like garbage collection where maybe they won't be disrupted, or maybe it's a secondary uh, uh, process where it, it will have, um, the technology itself will affect uh, even the waste management business. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? I didn't mean to say I could predict, uh, you know, waste management trends for 10 years. Yeah. But the, the article I think you're talking about is Wired Magazine, June 2001. Yes. It's called yes. That's and, it. Andy Grove's Rational Exuberance is what it's called. Right. But yeah. So it's it's actually time for my final question. And I know you're um, a podcast listener. So you've heard this done many times and uh, you're, you're a previous guest also. The final question is the same for every guest. And it is simply, if you could leave our listener with a single thought today, what would it be? Hmm. You know, it's funny. I was going to try to prepare and, uh, cause I knew this was coming. And so, and of course I'm, 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 I'm not prepared because we've talked about so many, so many different things. Um, you know, okay. So let's go back to one of your, um, one of your guests, uh, Diego Perea, and um, he talked about um, bubbles and what what constitutes a a bubble. Um, and he said it was a a false belief system. It was a a, a, a misconception. And so you know, I thought about the various bubbles that we've had: the Japan bubble. Uh, the, you know, the misconception was that. Uh, Japan was on the rise and America was in decline. And then uh, you had the tech bubble and the misconception there wasn't, it wasn't um, uh, the internet. The internet was very much real, but it was this idea of first mover advantage. You know, what we talked about earlier. And as it turned out, the, the, uh, the pioneers took the arrows in the back. Um, and then, then of course you had the, the, the credit bubble and the, the misconception was, was uh, that uh, housing prices would keep going up. 
I think what makes this bubble, uh, it's been called the everything bubble. I think what makes this bubble different is the magnitude of it. And, you know, I think it's really important to kind of get this right in terms of what the, what the false belief is. And I think the false belief is the belief in government, that the you know, government throwing trillions of dollars at the things and government intervention is, is going to either solve the problem or is not going to have a lot of negative consequences. And so um, that also leads to where, where the risk is. And, uh, and I think the, the risk today, if I think about it, and where the, ma where the malinvestment, as the Aus Austrians like to use this term, malinvestment, is, um, and, and to me, it's in government. It's in Washington, D.C. It's in the debt of Washington, D.C. So um, the risk today is, you know, if, if you look at something that's obvious, and if we're looking out over the next 10 years, do I want to own U.S. government bonds yielding, you know, one or one or two percent? And I, to me, I'm having a hard time seeing any scenario where that works out. So, um, you know, that would be my nomination for kind of the no-brainer uh, 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 investment that you would want to inv avoid, let's say, over the next 10 years. That's a great answer. Love it. Well, thanks for being here, man. I, I, I'm glad that we got another chance to, to talk with you and sort of update what you're thinking about. Well, thanks for having me back. I'm, I'm, I'm honored. I've, you know, as, as you know, I've become a, a really big fan of the podcast, and I think I've listened to, to most of them over the last 15, 15 months. And, and uh, you know, it's great that you, you have a, a wide range of guests and getting different perspectives. Um, uh, it's it's really been been terrific and helpful to me, so I appreciate that. Oh, I'm I'm really glad to hear that. Boy, that was that was great. That was the the Kevin Duffy endorsement, man. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Good catching up with you. Take care. For everyone listening, there's a breaking story making noise around our offices this week. All automobile manufacturers are getting on the electric bandwagon, and it's not just Tesla. The reason why I mention this is because there's one stock that my colleague Bill Shaw recently identified that is uniquely set up to benefit from this new growing demand in electric vehicles. No, it's not lithium. It's another resource that's even more critical for electric vehicles. In fact, every Tesla Model 3 needs approximately 121 pounds of it, about five or six times more than the amount needed for gas-powered cars. Bill explains everything in a video he just released where he talks about the specific $4 resource stock in detail at $4stock.com, the number $4stock.com. Check it out. Well, that was one of the widest ranging discussions that we've ever had here on the podcast with a guest. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I always talk... I enjoy talking and interacting with Kevin Duffy, talking with him, uh, interacting on Twitter and over emails. We email some. Um, and he's always thoughtful, always insightful, and always from a different angle. And I think um, his passion for Austrian economics creates that. I think most people don't have that in their toolkit, so they don't see things the same way. It's great. But there's one thing I want you to notice about this discussion that went all over the place. We sort of weaved back and forth between the individual companies and the industries and then into the macro ideas that influence them and then kind of back to the companies, right? Like, for example, the way we talked about regulation and we said that regulation favored the incumbents in a particular industry and we talked about, I think, Kevin mentioned Microsoft, and we mentioned the tobacco companies, um, and exactly how when you when you say you're not allowed to advertise anymore, and you're going to penalize these tobacco companies, um, it sort of cements your leadership in the marketplace and prevents new competition from coming in. And that was just one example, and we we kind of went all over the place. But that ability that he has to and you heard him say, it's a conscious thing. He pays attention to the macro on purpose. Um, and But he also, when he came down to, you know, in the beginning, sorry, we were talking about his portfolio. Um, 
he's very much a bottom up guy who thinks about the industry and the type of business. Is it a, you know, a steady eddy business? He mentioned those and the economically sensitive businesses sounded to me like he wanted to have a really diversified kind of portfolio in equities. Um, which of course, you know, I like that idea. And he's aware of individual business characteristics just as much as he's aware of macro factors influencing those businesses. That's kind of rare, I think, to, to get somebody who's really good at that. And Kevin Duffy is very good at it. And I'm glad we had a chance to talk with him again. It was great. All right. That was wonderful. Let's take a look at the mailbag. Let's do it right now. On June 24th, I invited Dr. David Eifrig on the show to discuss the greatest upset in the history of American retirement. If you missed the event, you still have another chance at Doc's thesis, but in a different way. Dr. David Eifrig says what's coming next is a phase he calls financial lockdown. So consider this your final wake up call. He believes millions of Americans will be pushed down out of the middle class, out of private retirement and private health care and out of a decent life based on independence and privacy. Visit www.messagefromdoc.com to find out what's happening, what's coming next, and most importantly, four steps Doc says you should take right now to protect your investments in the years to come. Again, that website is messagefromdoc.com. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Just send your questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows, and I respond to as many as possible. You can also call our listener feedback line at 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Lots of great feedback this week. Lots of it. And, and from uh, many of our regular correspondents and, and regular listeners. And the, the first one is actually a question from last week. And it's a question about crypto and quantum computing. And I sent the question to Eric Wade, Stansberry's crypto guru, who we're going to talk with soon on an upcoming episode. And he shot me back an answer, and I'm going to read that answer. So I'll read Stephen H.'s question first. Stephen H. says, Hi, do you think that the dawn of quantum computing will be a Y2K-like event? From what I'm reading, quantum computers are developing at a rate that, where they will soon be able to crack standard public encryption systems. The potential consequences include personal loss, business losses, and even military and state losses. I have to believe our military leaders have their pulse on this threat and are planning accordingly. Should investors not be pressing management at the companies they invest in on how they are preparing for this threat? What about our brokerage companies? Thanks again for all your great work on the podcast, Stephen H. Right, So you may recognize the question from a previous episode, but that was my answer. This is Eric Wade's answer. This is a better answer. <laughs> Eric Wade says, yes, absolutely. Half of what you're hearing will all be true. Now, the interesting part is, of course, which half? Just like oil pipelines and meat packers and hospitals, municipalities are constantly attacked with phishing attacks, even though we have the technology to defeat them, I fully expect some computer systems to be successfully attacked by quantum computers. But I also fully expect that there will be as much innovation and new solutions, some of which already exist. They just don't sell papers so we don't hear about them. And they'll do a great job of protecting most systems against most quantum threats. Blockchains will fork, banks will upgrade, others will cross their fingers and hope for the best. So yeah, what it boils down to is going to be who protects themselves versus who clicks on the harmless quantum cat, quantum video, quantum link, and wipes out everything linked to their computer. In a nutshell, the technology to attack and the technology to defend are both progressing. We wrote in depth about it for Crypto Capital a while back. Eric Wade's Crypto Capital is the newsletter that he writes for Stansberry for crypto traders and investors. And, and that's his answer to that question. I think in the future, 
I'll just shoot him to Eric and wait till he gets back to me. I won't try to answer. But but you notice that he did, he, he expounded on the same theme, right? If the technology advances, it's going to advance on both sides, the, the attacking and the defending. Next comes an unprecedented two questions from one listener because they were both just so darn good. And the listeners, Taylor S., a regular correspondent, regular listener, Taylor S.'s first question how do I set a foundation or framework for myself to navigate all the conflicting information out there? And then Taylor gives the example of seeing signs of inflation, feeling like the purchasing power has de declined significantly, and then not wanting to in leave savings lying in a savings account, but wanting to invest in stocks. But then on the other hand, there's so much information about the bubble and people like Michael Burry calling it the mother of all bubbles. And then Taylor says, so I think to myself, what the hell am I supposed to do? Am I damned if I do and damned if I don't? It has honestly pushed me towards being a passive investor in a total stock market index fund. I can't seem to make sense of all the information. So I think I would rather just place my money on general human progress, a set it and forget it kind of framework. Let me know your thoughts. Thanks, Taylor S. Taylor, I'm going to keep it short. You answered your own question. Did you hear yourself answering your own question? You answered your own question. I can't just spit out a framework for you. It's something you have to develop on your own. But in the meantime, as you learn to, to figure out what's important in the headlines, if anything, most of it's not, and what's not, and how you ought to behave, you, you seem to have hit on a solution for yourself. To me, I think the core of the answer lies in what I call true diversification. I've said this over and over again for a couple of years now. To me, a core true diversified portfolio is stocks and bonds, plenty of cash, gold and silver, a little Bitcoin and maybe some real estate or some kind of what most people would think of as a collectible like art or Ferraris or you know vintage guitars or something based on your personal knowledge of those things. You shouldn't buy them if you don't really know them intimately. But you know, I don't know what you know intimately, so maybe they're they're a sensible place for you to store a little money. So so that's my answer. I'm going to get to your second question. Taylor has a second question. Hey, Mr. Ferris, second question. Is this, is the 401k a scam? Recently, I considered withdrawing my 401k completely for various reasons. I have since learned from Vanguard that I can't withdraw it even if I wanted to pay the tax and early withdrawal penalty based on my company's contract. I have to prove hardship. I have to be 59 and a half if they don't extend the age by my retirement. If I take a loan against it, I can only take half and then I will owe it back. I can't move it unless I leave my job. I can only contribute up to their limits. I can only buy into the funds available to me with fees that are not clearly displayed. With all these restrictions, it got me thinking, is it even my money if I can't freely access it? I can't imagine wealthy people, wealthy people have or need 401ks, so I think it's safe to assume only the middle class does. Are we locked in just so we can stabilize the market? I feel like a pawn. Let me know your thoughts. Thanks, Taylor S. I know billionaires who have, I know at least one billionaire who has a 401k, Taylor. It's a good tool, but you, you know, as you point out in blistering detail, there are limits, right? And you know, it's, a, it's created by the government, right? I mean, it's a tax advantage thing, right? It's a way to get around taxes. So naturally, they're going to put all kinds of restrictions on it. But it's not a scam. And I think it's still worth doing for most people. Great question, though. Fantastic question. Next comes listener Dean, who actually called into our call-in line on a recent episode. And Dean sent me a quote. And the quote is from William Wrigley Jr., manufacturer and chewing gum industrialist. That Wrigley, the Wrigley's chewing gum guy. William Wrigley Jr. He's, and the quote is, when two men always agree, one of them is unnecessary. And Dean says, you're a smart guy. I'm sure you can see all kinds of meaning in that quote. I challenge you to figure out how to take that quote and bring it into your podcast in your usual manner of eloquence to make a great point. As you heard from my previous gushing, I love your show and can't wait for Thursday to roll around each week. I have converted... I have converted three of four kids to listening. They got a kick out of hearing their old man on the show, Dean. So the quote is fantastic. D, 
Dean, it speaks for itself, man. I there's there's nothing to weave in. It's just brilliant. When two men always agree, one of them is unnecessary. And but the underlying point, though, right, is that two men don't. No two people always agree. It's ridiculous. And each of us, is, you know, nobody's unnecessary, right? Uh, or maybe even to the extent that you are always in agreement with your colleagues or you know your boss or whoever. Maybe rethink that because you could be, you know, talking yourself straight out of a straight out of a job. Good quote, thank you, Dean. Next come, comes Coach Z, another regular correspondent and listener. Coach Z says, Dan, love your show, never miss it. While I agree with your assessment that a market correction is nearly imminent, it feels a little like waiting for Godot. While I see and agree the value of purchasing relatively cheap insurance with put options, I have lost a little more than I'd like the last few months. Is there a market signal or indicator that can be used that shows an increased probability of correction? The question is not if insurance should be bought, but when. Thank you for all your wisdom. All the best, Coach Z. Coach Z, I don't bother. If you've losing too much, you're putting too much in. That's all there is to it. My expectation is that my put options will go to zero. I expect to lose money for the same reason I buy insurance and don't expect my house to be hit by you know, all the things that, that it's insured against, right? I just pay the insurance premium and I never see them again. And I kind of hope I never see them again, right? Do, do I really want the market to crash? I don't know. What will it do to the rest of the portfolio? So if you can't take the expense, you're, you're either doing it wrong, putting too much in, or you shouldn't do it at all. And that's why I've counseled that just holding lots of cash is really the best way it's the best way to diversify. It's the best way to protect yourself against a big drawdown if you're afraid one is imminent. That's all I got, Coach Z. Good question, though. Wade S. is next. He says, hi, Dan. I recently found the following statistics. Almost one out of four of the companies in the Russell 3000 index are not making enough money to pay even the interest on their debts. That's 44% more companies than last year. And last year, those zombies owed about a trillion dollars. Now it's almost two trillion. Do you see a scenario where this risk taking and debt will reduce gradually and see that ratio of zombie companies go down without some level of economic calamity? If I had a guess, statistics like that have the smart money with their hand ever present over the panic sell button. Great show. It's, o it's the only podcast I never miss, Wade S. Thanks, Wade S. Thanks for the kudos. I'm going to read the next question, then I'm going to answer yours. The next question is from Mark S., and it's our final question of the week. Mark says, I've been following your thoughts on the stock market being at the most expensive moment in history. While I admit that it does seem likely that things would resolve with a sell-off in some form or another, it occurs to me that another way prices could make sense is with a jump in sales. With the growth we're seeing in inflation and the pickup in demand from the relaxing of COVID-related restrictions, a significant jump in sales could appear over the next few years. I'm just curious what you think about this scenario. I'm not suggesting that one should bet one way or the other, but it seems to make sense to prepare for both scenarios, realizing there may be ways out of this mess that don't involve a large stock market crash. Thanks and take care, Mark S. Wade and Mark, you're both in the same ballpark here, right? Can we get out of this extreme overvaluation that I'm always, you know, gesticulating wildly about behind the microphone and, and, and being, you know, downright hysterical about sometimes because it seems so egregious. Could we get out of this mess, this extreme overvalued moment, most extreme moment in history without a big drawdown in the S&P 500 and, and the other big indexes? And, and, you know, you both talk about ways that we get out of this, you know, without some level of economic calamity or, you know, via inflation or, and the relaxing of COVID restrictions. And I will answer you both the same way. I think about this all the time. What if we really do grow our way out of this high multiple, right? You know, some, some companies look expensive all the time. And yet they just seem to keep growing and growing and growing. They grow their way out of their high multiple. So it doesn't seem like it was so high at all. You know, you look at, you look back five years ago and the multiple might have been, you know, 10 times earnings or less, you know, current earnings. 
But you know, to to look forward five years and go, ah, oh, we're probably ten times five years from now. It seems a little dicey, but that's the way it is when you get a really great business that you want to hold for the long term. And you could argue, well, this is a really great economy to hold for the long term. And so all these companies, yeah, they're expensive, but aren't they going to grow their way out of it? And couldn't this all resolve without a crash? And the answer is, sure, it could. But here's my my only problem with that is that. We're at a more expensive moment than the dot-com peak and the 1929 peak. It's the biggest bubble in history. Something about that, you know, the folks at, at GMO, they've studied 330 of these bubbles and they never resolve this way that you're suggesting. Never. They always correct. Huge, you know, down 50% pretty quick like that. So I'm going to say it's possible I think it's less likely. I think it's more likely that we get a huge correction in in the big stock indexes than that we grow our way out of it. But you're both so smart for knowing that that must cross your mind. You must deal with that scenario. Good for you. Excellent question. Excellent mailbag today. Good on all of you who wrote in. Great stuff. That's another mailbag, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We provide a transcript for every episode. Go to www.investorhour.com, click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, click on the word transcript, and enjoy. If you like this episode, send someone else a link to the podcast so we can continue to grow. Anybody you know who might enjoy the show, just tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at InvestorHour.com. Do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at InvestorHour. Follow us on Twitter, where our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want me to interview? Drop me a note, feedback at investorhour.com. Call the listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell me what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to investorhour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email, feedback at investorhour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.